A sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. said we'll have a short video that was like a blink <laughs> well good afternoon and welcome to the program uh, with the commonwealth club and its programming branch in forum i'm brenda wright a member of the board of governors for the commonwealth club and today we have two audiences we have one virtual so welcome and hello everybody and for those of you that have joined us here, I just can't tell you how happy I am to see you. I said I wasn't go, gonna go on and on about it. I'm so glad to see people. But you know, it's just like your first day when your parents let you ride the bus by yourself. Today, this is our first in-person program that we've done in our beautiful building since March 2020. And we're thankful to all of you that decided to come and join us in person. You know, despite that shelter in place that left our doors closed most of the last year, our staff and the leadership here at the Commonwealth Club worked hard to continue to bring us together for some fascinating educational and entertaining programs. We're thrilled to open our doors again to you this summer and beyond, so not just today, you can come back <laughs> other times. Um, so that, you know, to celebrate civility, curiosity, and perseverance. And I would say that perseverance is really the word. In the coming months, we'll have more programs like this in person and virtual audiences. And we're just so honored to have you here. When I was saying this, I said, God, am I going to sound mushy? But we are. We're just so honored to have you here that you've chosen the Commonwealth Club. So I just want to see how many of you is this your first real outing? Those of you that are home, I don't see you, but <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, and what a way to kick it off, but talking about barbecue. <laughs> now, you probably would never expect to have this at the Commonwealth Club <laughs> to talk about barbecue. Uh, we're in for a treat today because we'll hear from the James Beard Award winner food writer and soul food scholar, Mr. Adrian Miller, and I think I'm a soul food scholar too, my friends will tell you that. Uh, his new book, Black Smoke, African Americans and the United States of Barbecue, chronicles the often mistold story of a beloved tradition barbecue. Now, I'm from St. Louis, and the folks in St. Louis, he's doing this with his head, the folks in St. Louis will tell you that they make the best barbecue ever. When I was looking at this and they were talking about Mr. Horn being a pit master, I was like, ooh, no, my granddaddy was a pit master. <laughs> he had his own grill, which you couldn't touch. He cut the wood, soaked the chips, put them, aside. I don't know what he soaked them in, but anyway, and made the sauce. But, I will say to you that some of my best memories were around going to what we call barbecues. 
As Adrian states in his book, this is a story of entrepreneurship, culinary innovation, and most importantly, the tenacity of the black community. Now, Mr. Cohen, who is my granddad, he would say it's about black people making a way out of no way. That's what he would say. Today, Adrian is gonna be in conversation with food writer and columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, Justin Phillips. Now, now I have instructions I have to give you. You know, during this week, everybody's gotta to learn to give instructions. In the last 15 minutes of this conversation, you will get a chance to ask Adrian a live question. If you're here in our headquarters, Justin will let you know you can quietly line up in the back of the room to ask a question. If you're watching online, please type your questions in the chat section of the live stream. And we're gonna try to get through as many questions as possible. Now to the good part. And I'm sorry, people at home that are with us virtually. Uh, following the program, we invite you to a special barbecue after party on our rooftop with food provided by Horn Barbecue. Legendary pitmaster Matt Horn and his wife Nina will also be joining us upstairs. We're in conversation with Justin. Matt will detail his rise as a superstar in the culinary world and what barbecue means to him. When we get to the roof, Adrian will also be signing copies of his books, so I hope everybody got one. Uh, we won't be lining up, helping you line up to get your book signed. Within your books, there is a number, and we're please kind of keep an ear out for when your number is called, because that's when you will come up to the signing booth to get your book signed. So just finally, on behalf of the Commonwealth Club, a very special thanks to you, our community, for your support. To learn more about the Commonwealth Club, please visit us at commonwealthclub.org. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Adrian Miller and Justin Phillips to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. Well, that was a great way for us to enter the stage, and I feel like we have our work cut out for us. People were promised food after this. I know, we're between you know? them and the food. <laughs> right, right. we're between you guys. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's program with Inforum and the Commonwealth Club. This is the first in-studio audience in 15 months. I'm Justin Phillips, a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. Today, I'm honored to be in conversation with food writer, James Beard Award winner, attorney, and certified barbecue judge, Adrian Miller. <laughs> <laughs> this is off to a good start. Yeah. No one's thinking about the food. Yeah, the certified barbecue. That's the best conversation starter I've ever had. I mean, had. absolutely. In honor of the 4th of July, we're here to explore an inherently American tradition, Southern barbecue. The history of barbecue is a smoke-filled story of black perseverance, culinary innovation, and entrepreneurship. It's also, like many things, a misunderstood story. We are here to learn about the real history of barbecue in America and the critical role that African Americans have played in that story. At the end of the conversation, like we said earlier, you will get the opportunity to ask questions. I will let everyone know when we're ready, and when I do, you can line up slowly in the back of the room. Um, if you're watching virtually, please ask your questions in the chat, and we'll get through as many as possible. Now let's rock and roll. Um, so one of the things that I want to do with Adrian, before we get into the book, uh, your background is so unique to me that I kind of want to like ease into this before we get into the details. Also, you know, everyone should read the book too, so I don't want to give everything away. Right, right. Um, so we're going to start here. Before you, before you became Adrian Miller, as the food world knows you, you were in the world of politics, even uh, doing work with the Clinton administration. Am I right? Yes. 
So I, I wanted to ask, which is harder, being in, being in a room where you have to develop policies that affect millions of people, or telling one person the history of barbecue? <laughs> Oh, man. I think it's the telling one person the history of barbecue. <laughs> Why is that? Because a lot of people don't really pay attention when you're doing the policy until you mm -hmm. get to the end result. Mm. With barbecue, people come in with their own perceived notions, preconceived notions of what it is, how to do it right. And so, you know, part of the fun is the arguing about barbecue. But uh, <laughs> what I found is a lot of people really don't know the true history of barbecue, okay. but they are dead set on what they think it is. Everyone has really strong beliefs when it comes to this topic. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I was going into the book uh, knowing I was going to be educated and also knowing that I would probably want to have a fist fight whenever we got to meet each other. That's so part of it. That's part of, that's part of the education. So one of the, one, of the also, one of the things that I also want to talk about too is, is I feel like Adrian has like a superhero origin story, right? When it comes to being a writer and a historian, everyone has that point where they wanted to get and wanted to break through and learn more about a topic. Uh, for you, it was when you read Southern Food at Home, On the Road, in History by John Edgerton. Edgerton. Yeah. Um, so there was a part, uh, the author believed that there had yet to be written a, uh, a true tribute to black achievement in uh, the American culinary scene. Yeah. So if we fast forward to right now, do you think that gap has been filled somewhat? Do you think there has been quality work that has been done? And how far do we have to go to until you feel like that that gap is until you feel like we're we're at a right a good place? No, I think we've made a lot of um, progress on that in the last fifteen years. So when I first started looking at the subject, you know, there wasn't really much written. In fact, when I um, what launched this journey was unemployment. Oh, I was a, <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> I was in between the Clinton administration and at that time in my life, I wanted to be the senator from Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to get back to Colorado and start my political career, but the job market was really slow. I was watching a lot of daytime television. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to tell you what shows. Oh, um, I mean, now you got to tell me. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and in the depth of my depravity, I said, I should read something. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what got me to Edgerton's book. So I would say, so there wasn't much written. And when I wrote, reached out to food writers, mm -hmm. when I decided to start this journey, a lot of uh, the food writers uh, told me, hey, look, there's not much on African-Americans. This country's racist. You're just not going to find that much stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the people I talked to were of a certain demographic, mm -hmm. so they hadn't really heard of this thing called the internet. Mm. And with the internet, I mean, I, I quickly had enough information to write five books. Wow. So, but in that time, you know, Jessica B. Harris, and if you all have seen Netflix, High on the Hog, um, yeah, great series. Uh, I think it was number two on Netflix overall during the Memorial Day weekend. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. But it's a, a look at the history of African-American food. Jessica B. Harris was certainly the pioneer kind of in mm -hmm. this field. Mm -hmm. um, so her book and then that High on the Hog series and then other people like Michael Twitty, uh, mm -hmm. Tony Tipton Martin. Mm -hmm. And Michael Twitty is interesting because he's talking about antebellum food ways as well as right. he's um, black, gay and Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so he's talking about the connection. I know <laughs> he's talking about the connections of all of those things. Um, and Tony Tipton Martin mm -hmm. has certainly written a lot. So there's a lot more food writing happening, yeah. but we still have a ways to go because right. there's so many stories that remain untold. Yeah, so. you're right. It is, it is a space that has a ton, a ton of talent, yourself yeah. included. Um, so we're going to stay back in the backstory part. Um, so your first full-time job was at Luther's Barbecue in Aurora, Colorado, which, um, you know, I th uh, it burned down, like you said. Uh, Not by me. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Adrian didn't burn it down. <laughs> yeah. Let me rephrase that. Yeah. Um, but it, at that time, you were working as a, uh, as a dishwasher, um, you know, cleaning tables and that part of that played a part in your development and interest in barbecue. So I, I wanted to know, as a dishwasher and a busser, is there anything that is a cardinal sin to leave unfinished on your plate at a barbecue restaurant? <laughs> so for me, it's the barbecue spare rib, because that's my ah. touchstone. That's my go-to thing. So to see a, an untouched spare rib, I mean, because look, cooking is an act of love, right? I mean, when somebody cooks for you, they, they're saying they care about your survival. It's right. sustenance. Right. Even if the food is straight nasty, right? The mm. act of doing that is meaningful. So, you know, just find that food for somebody. If you're not feeling it, just get it to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. So they can savor that. Yeah. So, so basically clean your plate. Yeah. That's such a little clean your plate. Um, and so we're going to stay in the backstory part. Uh, as, so uh, I've also been curious about this. Like you talk about this in the book. This is in the, the earlier stages. Um, 
you know, you're a, an official barbecue judge, but you also admit like your shortcomings when it comes to barbecue. I, I think you were like, you still, your pork shoulder might not be on point, like the brisket, you still gotta learn the game of that one. But, you know, being a judge too, and also knowing your shortcomings, is that a crucial element to being able to understand what makes barbecue special? Like knowing what your flaws are in that same space. Yeah, because great barbecue comes through the trial and error process of, you know, you gotta just put in the time and uh, make those mistakes and learn from it. I mean, Matt Horn will tell you that, because he, he's self-taught for the most part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he'll tell you about all the stuff that you've messed up. So yeah, uh, at this point in my journey, I'm much better at eating barbecue than cooking it. Um, but you know, <laughs> I, I endeavor. <laughs> yeah. And so, all right, we're gonna go uh, a little bit to barbecue on a, on a more personal level. And one of the things, um, so language is important, as you know, as a writer. Um, should we, should we or should we not be using the term pit masters? Or what, what's the phrase that you would like to use? Cause... So I like the term barbecuer, mm -hmm. and that's, I use that intentionally in the book um, to stay away from that idea of pit master. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing to understand is that pit master is a very uh, recent term, relatively speaking, with barbecue. Barbecue has been around several centuries. Pitmaster really didn't come into the language until the 1950s or so. Mm -hmm. And Daniel Vaughn, who's the barbecue editor of Texas Monthly Magazine, is the one who kind of dug that up. So back in the day, say in the 1900s, 1800s, uh, they would call them superintendents. So mm -hmm. you were superintending a barbecue. And then later it became barbecue man, because mm -hmm. most of them were men. Um, and then only later, you know, and then it was barbecue king. Everybody was calling themselves Barbecue King because self-promotion is a huge part of barbecue. So they were as numerous as Saudi Arabian princes, mm -hmm. you know, those Nigerian princes mm -hmm. emailing us. us. Yeah. yeah. So um, that was all part of the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I prefer bar barbecue. -er. Okay. Uh, I like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and another reason why I do that is because, as you find out in my book, there's a strong association with slavery. Mm, yeah. So, um, you know, I keep thinking about that. And, but that, that's why I use barbecue. -er. You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a really, really good point. Um, and you, you talk, <laughs> you, you've talked about this uh, before as well. Um, so let's, I want to touch on like that painful racist part of, which is weaved into everything in America, but mm -hmm. uh, with barbecue. And um, you talked about how like in the book, how barbecue talent among slaves was a point of uh, plantation owner pride, right? They... Um, but also at this time, plantation owners would whip slaves. Uh, they would cover, like when this happened, they would cover them in barbecue sauce. In Jim Crow era, there were lynchings called Negro barbecues. Um, and then also during Jim Crow, uh, white restaurant owners objectified the black barbecue style, like by, uh, you know, forcing cooks to the margins through and, and using these like caricatures of like, you know, Aunt Jemima or something like that. So I, I grew up uh, in Louisiana. I grew up below the Mason-Dixon line. There are a ton of, uh, and you know this, eating around the country. Like I, a small town, there are a ton of barbecue spots and, and soul food restaurants where the owners might lead, lean into this, right? Like lean into this um, kind of like stereotype at some point. Not to say they're behaving this way, but they don't mind like being called Big Mama or something like that. Yeah. Do you think... Be, us being able to take control of a narrative like that, is that empowerment by using the character for our economic in, advantage, or do you not want to see that kind of um, style of restaurant or brand of restaurant? You know, like what, what's your, pre what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I'm about reclaiming uh, things because I think uh, by reclaiming it, we can take the sting out mm -hmm. of certain things. So, you know, one thing, I, um, this is not necessarily barbecue, right. but uh, the way that t fried chicken and watermelon have become so toxic, mm -hmm. you know, I definitely want us to reclaim that because it's some of the most delicious stuff on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that, that, there's a lot of reasons why that, those stereotypes cause harm. Yeah. Um, and, but to give just a little bit of context, what, what a lot of people don't know is that I believe that barbecue is made possible by, the ens by enslaved labor mm -hmm. because... Uh, Barbecue, old school barbecue was very labor intensive. You mm -hmm. had to dig a trench, a mm -hmm. couple feet wide, a little, couple feet deep. You had to fill that trench with, barbe uh, with hardwood burning coals. Uh, animals had to be slaughtered and processed and butterfly poles stuck on them. And then somebody had to flip that through the cooking and somebody had to replenish the coals in the fire. 
and, you know, it just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And then not only that, after all that work was done, the prep work and all this stuff, then enslaved uh, African Americans were asked to entertain. So it was a black experience from beginning from to beginning end. From beginning to end, yeah. yeah. But the thing that's key here is that barbecue, old school barbecue was scalable. So in the early 1800s, you're reading about barbecues for 10,000, 20,000 people. Right. You don't hear about fried chicken dinners for 10,000, right? Because the logistics are completely, they're impossible. Mm -hmm. But it's possible with barbecue and enslaved labor. So by the time you get to the early 1800s, like 1830s or so, you're getting newspaper articles saying legitimate barbecue you need to have a Negro man or colored mm -hmm. man, the language of the time, mm -hmm. do X, Y, or Z. So we're like part of the recipe. Yeah, that's how wet we are. That's yeah. a great way to put it. Yeah. It's so it's so interesting that you brought up the the idea of um, like consuming chicken or watermelon like in a public space. I, I've thought it makes me think of like there's this Dave Chappelle joke that he did during stand up one time where he was eating a uh, chicken in public and he said like a white person saw him and they were like just like in the encyclopedia, I read about this, he loves it. And so he gets like self-conscious about it, right? And so me personally, I also think about that. I also think about like consuming watermelon in a space where it's not predominantly black. But, but here's, here's one interesting thing though. Yeah. If you go back and look at the literature of the 1870s and 80s when these stereotypes are getting power, mm -hmm. Catfish, barbecue, we're all part of it. Yeah, Some of the most yeah. racist stuff is about barbecue, but we don't hold the same stigma for barbecue now. That, le that, that's a, that leads me perfectly to this, because I was wondering that same thing. I don't feel self-conscious. Like if you know we're I'm eating barbecue in a space that isn't predominantly filled like filled with people that look like us. Mm -hmm. I don't think you know none of my friends, none of my family members. What is it about? Is it the is it a communal aspect or why is that food different? Because you're still at some points eating chicken. You're still at some points you know why is that different? Why is barbecue different? I haven't unpacked that because mm -hmm. I'm looking back over time and um, the, some of the barbecue stere stereotypes were just as pernicious. Mm -hmm. I think it's just if you were to to have a scale, I think the tonnage of crap about fried chicken and watermelon just far exceeds barbecue. I got you. I, I just okay. think that. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. The, um, so I, I do love sometimes when you reference things that you've said to uh, other well-known people, especially writers. So you once told John Grisham, uh, when he asked you what's the difference between black and white barbecue, your response was simply, black barbecue tastes better, right? <laughs> I respect it, you know, I was like, okay. That also made me spit out my coffee when I was reading it. Um, so, all right, let's say, so that blanket, let, let's make that blanket, let's say that blanket statement is true. What can be said about the visual, the aesthetic qualities of black barbecue that makes it different from, um, you know, if there is, yeah, yeah, from white barbecue, I guess. Yeah, I knew this was gonna be hard to kind of prove this chapter, write this chapter and kind of For prove sure. my point. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I just think after you've eaten a lot of ap a barbecue made by African Americans, there's a certain visual aspect, like you're expecting to see char. Mm. Um, the, the meat is not as butchered. So for instance, spare ribs, that's my touchstone. So in a, in a black joint, you're not gonna see St. Louis cut ribs that often. And the St. Louis cut is this, the ribs are ovular in their shape. And so the St. Louis cut, is taking off the tips and just trying to create a more rectangular uniform look. Black joints, you're gonna see the rib tip attached. Mm -hmm. You might even see that flap on the back of ribs. You know, that, that it's just less butchering and, and more fat. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, highly seasoned and definitely without a doubt sauce. <laughs> so there's this emerging conventional wisdom that barbecue should be unsauced. I, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say most black people would say, says who, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. All right. So <laughs> black people back me up. I like that. Um, because you go, you, I've been to barbe black barbecue joints where you get your plate and it's an ocean of sauce with yeah. little islands of meat poking. Little tiny, yeah, yeah. Because the sauce is the calling card. I got an email today from some guy. He's just like, I loved your book. My dad um, ran a barbecue joint in Ithaca, New York. Yeah. He's been gone for 30 years, but people still talk about the sauce. Yeah. yeah. They're not talking about the meat. Yeah. Talking about the sauce. There is a, uh, so my family lived in Jackson, Mississippi for a little while, and there's this place called, uh, oh man, I think it was like E&L's Barbecue, a little, little hole in the wall place. And I remember they would do the rib tips and give you a bowl of it. You would have to be like, yep. Mm -hmm. is, is there meat in there? Right. <laughs> it would used to just be the sauce just about. Right. And there are a lot of old school barbecue joints that would just give you sauce and bread. Yeah. And part of that was for poor, you know, poor customers who couldn't afford to have the meat. That's but that, you know, that shows you how important sauce is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that'll lead, that's a perfect way to lead to this. So uh, the interesting thing about, and 
we've talked about how complicated the discussions of barbecue history are, but let's talk about the taste of barbecue. Everyone has their favorite places, you know, and there's no real 100% consensus, I think, about what someone's favorite restaurant is in a city compared to someone else's. They might not agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a such thing as consistency in the creation of a barbecue? Or is it the, the fallible nature, I guess, of the exercise that makes it so unique? Like, do you almost not want it to be perfect that, and that's what makes it perfect, you know? Uh, so are we talking about an African-American context or just in general? Let's say uh, African-American context, yeah. For um, sure. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, no, I think that everybody, you know, has a signature, you know, mm -hmm. the, in, in, in Chinese culture is called wok presence, you know, so you bring something mm. and you make a dish. So I think people are expecting that. So, uh, yeah, the way you phrased it, that's interesting. I wish I had thought of that for my book. But, um, <laughs> yeah, this idea that, you know, as imperfect as it is, because mm -hmm. often African-American barbecue is going to be messier. Um, cause I think about a lot of spots that are celebrated, they're white owned, you know, the meat comes out, it's perfectly manicured. Right. It's just social media ready. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot, in a lot of black joints, it's going to be chopped up <laughs> white bread, you know, mm -hmm. sauce on it, maybe all wrapped together with fries mm -hmm. and drowned in sauce, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, I think it's more that kind of the imperfect part of it. They're like, this is this person's signature right? and I'm going to gobble it up. We definitely have those places that are like, hey, it was cool on Tuesday. It wasn't that great on Friday, but I'm going to go back on Saturday. Right. Like, or you, you call and ask who's cooking. Right? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's important. That's right. Yeah. 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 Who's, who's working in the kitchen? Yeah. Nah, I'm, I'm going to come back Yeah. <laughs> and I hate to say this. It seems to happen more in black joints. Yeah. You know, there, there's going to be out of stuff, right? <laughs> oh, can right. I get this? Oh, you know, Mrs. So-so didn't feel like making right. it today. Oh, right. yeah. All right. Or you, or, you know the, or you know the time frame to, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what, Adrian? I should bring you all on the road with me. You right. Know what yeah. Adrian and I are just going to turn this into a comedy, into a stand-up bit about black yeah. restaurants. No, I, yeah. uh, I think you're absolutely right. All right, so, so before we get too far off track, all right, now we can, um, now we can talk about the book. Uh, and I, I want to start about this, because we, we talked on the phone the other day, and, um, and I just want to start at this point. Your book does uh, uh, an amazing job of so many things. But um, one of them is highlighting the influence of uh, black women in um, barbecue in this country. And, you know, we can talk about from Kansas City, from um, Deborah and Mary Jones to Helen Turner in Brownsville to uh, Sylvie Curry in Los Angeles. Like they're, they're, but I want to give you the space. Yeah. right now to talk about that right well so barbecue is often presented as an all boys club right mm -hmm. um you know the the masculinity is drip, just dripping one of the jokes i wrote in my book is I'm, I'm surprised somebody hasn't created a you know well i mean i better not say a joke but anyway um you know even in my own family my mom my late mother she was the griller in chief mm -hmm. it's only later in life that my dad really took over the um, barbecue duties after my mom died mm -hmm. uh but one of in my book i give a lot of um profiles of people who I think really evoke the themes of a chapter. And one of the most fascinating people I came across was a woman named Mary John. Mm -hmm. um, but her, her birth name was Marie Jean because she was born when Arkansas was French territory. Mm -hmm. But uh, in 1840s in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, there is a newspaper account of her superintending a barbecue. Mm -hmm. And so that's the term for pit master back then. And so she ends up buying her freedom stays in Arkansas, runs a restaurant, it's highly regarded, and when she dies, uh, the white newspaper eulogizes her. So dig that, a black woman telling dudes what to do in 1840s Arkansas. So that just shows you how deep uh, black women run in and barbecue. And then, you know, I find these figures over time. Yeah. And uh, even, even if a place is not run by a black woman, a lot of these uh, men who are running spots will tell you, oh yeah, this is my grandmother's sauce recipe, or my mother taught me to do it. Sometimes the restaurants are named after women. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to really make that point that black women have been uh, in the barbecue game for a long time. Like I say, sisters have been grilling it for themselves mm -hmm. for a long time. The, um, can you talk about your, uh, uh, so your mom ran the, ran the show during barbecues. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like what, does she have a specialty? Was there anything? Oh yeah, so you know, she, she made the ribs. We, so we were more of a ribs, chicken, and hot link kind of family. All right. So that, that's my trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we would have other stuff for kids, right? Hamburgers, bratwurst, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but some of the fondest memories of her, the sauce. So she, my grandmother had her own sauce recipe, actually, which I found uh, as going through my mom's stuff. So I found this, the handwritten oh, wow. recipe, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, 
I'm, I'm letting out some secrets here. A lot of people just doctor commercial sauces mm -hmm. uh, oh. and call it their sauce. No. So I have fond memories of my mom taking um, open pit. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever heard of mm -hmm. open pit barbecue. Mm -hmm. And then cutting a lemon and putting in there with that other spices. So I have fond memories of just passing by on f J July 4th and seeing this lemon floating <laughs> in the barbecue sauce. And it was pretty slamming. I love that. That's amazing. Um, so maybe this is like a... We're going to keep on this line, but thinking about... Um, black businesses and and i want to make sure that I, I was trying to figure out how to work in a pandemic related question and i figure yeah. i'll just shoehorn it in right here but and i'm sure you saw this too adrian like at, at some point like the the pandemic took a heavy toll on black businesses in this country and i remember it was like early on it was like 40 percent or something were either closing or on the brink of closing and then we had a year of social unrest and people calling for you know racial justice uh black lives matter which has been doing work for years, got an even bigger stage right now um, out here in the Bay Area. We had a moment where people were, you know, called to go uh, support black businesses, right? And they saw like an, an uptick in, in support and probably it didn't last that long for many of them. But I, I'm curious to like, do you think this moment is going to have a lasting impact? This desire for people to do something positive like we have good you know people well-intended people out here in the bay area, bay area that aren't black that want to support these businesses do you think that's going to last and can that coupled with a post-pandemic desire to be in communal spaces for everybody yeah right like we all want to get together right like could this be a benefit down the line to black businesses or do you think you oh know? oh definitely and yeah. i think one reason why is is that the attention is still being paid Mm -hmm. Because typically in the past, we've, come, we've had communal moments around grief or tragedy, right? Um, and usually the energy lasts for a couple months and it dissipates. Right. And I haven't really seen that. Right. Um, you know, we're more than a year out and there are still people reading the books, asking the questions. Um, what I'm finding is um, a lot of people outside the black community are wondering, well, what can we do next? Mm -hmm. And are looking for actually practical suggestions on, on next steps. So I think ways to support businesses will be helpful. I just did a presentation the other day uh, and people were asking, well, is there a list of these black businesses in, in Denver that we could support? Um, the Colorado Restaurant Association has a program where they're giving select businesses gift cards. And the idea is that a customer comes, you give them a $25 gift card that will have them come back. And the card's already oh, paid for, right? Or oh. you could give it to somebody else, mm. right? And so I think we have to be vigilant and keep telling people these are ways to support black businesses in this time. So I, I think there is going to be um, some energy around that, but we have to keep that fire burning. Right. Um, but one thing that's interesting about barbecue, uh, so I'm going to say something that's going to sound in conflict, but mm -hmm. one of my favorite black owned barbecue joints in Denver did close because of the pandemic. But I think it's because they had a big space that relied a lot on in-person dining and a bar. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of black owned barbecue joints are takeout. Mm, so yeah, I, I'm, that's a good I'm point. thinking that's a really that good maybe point. they're come, doing all right. That's a, that's a very, very good point. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Especially down South, I imagine too. Like those are a lot of like little takeout stop in real quick joints. That's a, that's a very good right. point. Now there's a, there's another side of that, right. That reflects injustice because black entrepreneurs often don't get enough capital. Right. So that they can invest and have a sit down place. Right. So they're doing the best they can with the resources they have. Let alone afford a liquor license. Right. Which out here, a secondary market, they're crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, all right. So we're going to get a little granular here. Uh, and we talked, <laughs> we talked a little bit about it a second ago. So you make the argument in this book the, um, about barbecue, about barbecue te techniques and how they didn't migrate from the Caribbean as European colonists moved north. Uh, there's also a suggestion that America's barbecue is more homegrown, borrowed from Native Americans. Um, you know, and also in the book, you talk about how they used rotating uh, spits, raised platforms, the shallow pits, the vertical holes to cook their wild game. Uh, and then also at the same time, this is a long question. At the same time, you say there's a uh, little evidence, evidence to support the theory that American barbecue can trace its roots to West Africa. Um, and, and so I won't go too deeply into that, but that was something that there, we talked about earlier. Fellow food writer and historian Michael Twitty couldn't endorse. There's a story, and he was like, I just can't, I don't know if I can get down with that thinking. What is, 
What has the, the reception been, or have you been getting pushback from other people within your writer community who look like you about this? Because you dropped a lot of knowledge. Yeah. And I imagine that some people are going to be like, ah, you know, some other black writers are going to be like, oh, I don't know about that, man. Yeah, yeah. So actually, the most criticism I've gotten in that realm has been from other African Americans. And look, trust me, I wanted to prove without a doubt that barbecue was West African in origin. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do this and say Wakanda <laughs> forever. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I'm in a literary, literary tradition, and so I look at sources, and right now the available sources do not suggest that. Right. Um, and there's, there's a couple reasons why. First of all, uh, Europeans were in West Africa at least a century before they got to Americas. There are no, there's no documentation of this type of cooking. What we do know that happened is when Europeans show up in the Caribbean and they see this type of cooking, they're just, they talk about this as, as, as if it's something they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And they draw, write about it and make illustrations about it. These illustrations cause a sensation in Europe. And they had the same kind of view of Af Africans before. So I'm, I'm curious as to why that didn't happen. Right. The second thing is West Africans don't even cook like that today. Mm -hmm. If you look at West African barbecue, it's more uh, street food, skewers with chunks of meat, highly seasoned. And so this whole animal cooking that evolves in the South, it doesn't show up. Um, so what I did is because barbecue history is so hazy and, you know, it's problematic. And I think, you know, there is a there's a good criticism to say, well, you're relying on Europeans for this. But, you know, of the three major players in this, Native Americans, West Africans and Europeans, the Europeans are the only ones that have a literary tradition. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is oral history. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of hard to figure out what's going on. Okay. So I just relied on what Europeans said they saw. And it's problematic because looking at the sources, they weren't always good at the descriptions, and then there are a lot of times they had an agenda. Because mm -hmm. like the earliest barbecue scenes were just fish of the raised platform in the Caribbean. So mm -hmm. Columbus and crew in the 1490s, they see uh, Caribbean people um, doing, uh, cooking over a very slow fire on a raised platform, and on that platform were fish and vegetables mm -hmm. and iguanas, mm -hmm. okay? Um, when the Europeans with an agenda start writing about barbecue a couple decades later because they're bent on conquest and dehumanizing uh, the indigenous people in the Caribbean, all of a sudden human limbs start showing up on the barbecue grill, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So th it's problematic. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were several techniques that were seen in the American South, and pit barbecue, as I described earlier, is different than cooking on that raised platform. So right. to me, something else was going on. Mm -hmm. And it just looked like Europeans saw something that Native Americans were doing in Virginia, modified, added their quick grilling techniques, and then enslaved Africans get in the mix later. And that puts us on the road to something we call Southern barbecue. Mm -hmm. So all the people that have called me out, you know, because there have been some people like, you're not a real brother, man. You're saying that <laughs> Africans didn't, you know, I'm like, all right, look, here are the receipts. This is how I reached the conclusion if you show me. Yeah. Nobody has said I'm wrong. They haven't proved it. Right. Um, so, you know, the, rece the receipts are a big part, like, yeah. you know, I'm just like, write your own book, <laughs> prove it, but don't just, you know, cause a lot of people are like, well, it's black because I said it's so. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because, um, when we were going to do this, I was like, man, good for Adrian for writing this book. Damn, Adrian's probably getting a lot of crap for this because <laughs> like, I know people would want to argue about it. But also I, I think that's important to talk about your, uh, your perspective heading into it. You had a desire to prove something that black people have held true for a long time, right? Yeah. yeah. But you also were open to evidence showing different. How important is that when it comes to being uh, a food historian? Because I, I feel like a lot of people might just try to validate something that they already know, but you have to be way more open than that, right? And probably susceptible to being disappointed sometimes. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, to me, food, food tells a story, but I think... I, I, at least I am, I'm on a journey for truth. Mm, I like that. And I don't think that the fact that somebody else created something doesn't mean that it's wholly part of my culture mm -hmm. and that we did a lot to develop this thing that we all love today. And I don't think those are mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm on a journey for truth. I like that. And I'm fascinated by it where the story leads me, so. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, all right, so in the book, there's also recipe, recipes included, excuse me, and uh, there's one by Henrietta Dull. Am I saying her name? Yeah, yeah. Um, who uh, it was Butter Sauce, uh, which was per, uh, which was published in this uh, Southern Cooking volume. But I, anyway, the idea of older recipes, and you also mentioned fi finding your uh, your grandma your grandmother's barbecue sauce recipe. Yeah. So when it comes specifically to doing a book, what is the process of 
of finding these recipes that might be on, you know, barely legible paper. Like I imagine the recipe aspect, the recreation is a journey itself. It is. Um, so, you know, part of it is finding um, things in archival sources, sometimes your own family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can ask people for recipes, but usually what they give you is a lesser pea. You ever <laughs> heard that term? <laughs> So that's when somebody purposely leaves say, out something. You can't say stuff like that. <laughs> what? That's <laughs> God, that's so funny. Yeah. A lesser fee? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to take that. Yeah. Oh, so, man. Uh, so you, get, you have that aspect. Um, you know, uh, the boon of my, re and looking through old cookbooks, but um, what I found is there are not a lot of written recipes by African Americans in cookbooks. Yeah. Um, which was interesting to me because... Um, in soul food, Creole food, and other things, you, there are a lot of written recipes by African Americans. You know, usually a white person who the African American worked for would describe this recipe. You don't find a lot of those with mm. African Americans in barbecue, and I, I was always curious about that. Um, and then the really boon, the boon for my research was old newspapers. Mm. So a lot of recipes show up there. Yeah. Um, and that Henrietta Dull woman, she's a white woman. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I included her recipe, because you just don't have a lot of fully described recipes for whole hog cooking yes. the traditional way. Right. Um, and then if I can just give a public service announcement, another recipe could be from people you used to date. Mm. And uh, so my pro tip is if you are in a relationship with somebody who's a good cook, you know, do what you can to stay with that person. <laughs> but if you notice that things are getting rocky, I can tell you from personal experience, it's a lot easier to get recipes before you break up. <laughs> And so now we transition to the Adrian Miller relationship hour. <laughs> it'll be short. Yeah, it'll be short. The relationship minute, never mind. Um, I had a question after that. And you <laughs> made a joke and it made me completely forget where I was going. Oh, my bad. That's all right. Um, all right, so with cookbooks in mind, so now we're going to ease out a little bit. Um, uh, we'll dive back into specifics if we have time. So if there is a cookbook to come out, after you have conquered this inability to do pork shoulder and whatnot, what is Adrian Miller's contribution to the, to the recipe book? Is there something that you're good at, something that you would like to see? Like, I got good at this, and then I pass it along. What's, what's your contribution? So it would definitely be spare ribs. Okay. And then also, I would like to have some kind of red drink. Because, <laughs> okay. you know, you can have a beverage with barbecue. And, and you have to understand, red is, an important yeah, yeah. red is a color and a flavor yeah. in barbecue, uh, African-American culture. Yeah. So we don't call things cherry it's or strawberry. It's not cherry or, or apple. Or, yeah. It's red it's or red. it's purple. Right. Yeah. So I would like to have some kind of red drink. And actually, I have a bomb recipe for red drink. It's a hibiscus oh, nice. based drink. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty good. Um, <laughs> the good... <laughs> I'm sorry. Some of this stuff just really gets me, and I'm like <laughs> trying to get back on track. All right. Um, okay. Uh, and so I, I wanted to have a little bit of fun. Uh, so whenever I do these things, I would try to find something that's really random that people might not have known about, but um, but something that you might have mentioned in a story before. You used to watch House of Cards, right? Yes. Okay. So it got me thinking about black cooks in media. And I read a story where you were talking about in House of Cards, one of your favorite characters was Freddie. Mm -hmm. And if no one's seen that, uh, Freddie ran a barbecue spot. He was an old friend of the main character. Um, and <laughs> they wrote it in such a way where you were just like, damn, those, this food's probably good. You have no idea. Right. So <laughs> I, there, there is a part in that show where, Fre where Freddie meets the main character, Frank. It's like 7.30 in the morning, and Frank um, orders ribs and eats them all, right? And then orders seconds. I'm curious, Adrian, is 8 a.m. an ungodly hour to eat barbecue, or is there no time frame from when barbecue can be consumed? There's no I, time frame. There's no time frame. Nah. So 7.30 is okay. Yes. I could not, I, I didn't mind the scene. I was just like, eight in the morning. But that much, I, that was a little unrealistic. Now, okay. if it had Gates barbecue sauce on it, though. Oh, okay, solid. Oh, I gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and so while we're on this part as well, the uh so we're gonna go to some of your other work um so in 2013 uh you wrote a book that won a james beard award uh soul food the surprising story of american cuisine one plate at a time um and for people that aren't in the food world the 
it's sometimes kind of hard to explain what a James Beard Award is. Yeah. So I'm curious how you explained, because this is after your transition out of like what your family probably knew you as in politics and doing something specific and getting into this nebulous world of like food writing. When that award came, that was like a very, very big deal. But how did you explain that to people and what did that award do for your career itself? So I told people it's just like winning an Oscar for film nice, or a Grammy for music. And then people are like, oh, okay. Uh, so it's interesting. I don't think the James Beard Award means as much to writers as it does to chefs and restaurants. Yeah. Because I didn't see an immediate explosion in attention. I mean, it's been a slow build. Um, I've definitely gotten more. I mean, the biggest explosion of attention in my career was actually the high on the hog mm. uh, appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah. So, but, but it gave me street cred and it led to other things. Um, so that was definitely the case. Uh, but, you know, it was thrilling because I never expected that. Yeah. In fact, going into that, I had practiced two things. My acceptance speech <laughs> and then my fake, oh, I'm so happy you won instead of me. <laughs> oh, that's Look, good. You right, know, right. When they zoom in on you. <laughs> right. So, and I thought it was going to be the latter because that was my first book. So I, right. didn't, I didn't expect to win. So. Um, you know, and so now you're at a point where you've done, uh, I mean, and I, I think that, you know, this one's destined for the same kind of treatment. Like, uh, it's, it's such a thorough breakdown of such a complicated topic. But it almost feels like, and I know for you, it probably feels like forever. But for me, thinking of these books, there's not a huge gap of time between them in my head with all of the work that you do. Yeah. But can you talk about the work that goes into this? Because making something look easy doesn't mean it's easy. So right. can you talk about like the research? And so I've, I've only had a few strokes of genius in my life. Mm -hmm. And I had one in this case. Uh, when I started researching the soul food book, I just grabbed all the information I could about everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I included barbecue. So that lessened the time. Because the, the first book took about 12 years. Um, and in that course of 12 years, and that's because I had a day job. So it was like a side, side hustle, right? I see. I was like a grad gotcha. student, evenings, weekends, working on it. Um, I read 3,500 oral histories of formerly enslaved people. Wow. Looking for all references for food. I read thousands of newspaper articles and magazines articles. Because we have the Library of Congress and companies are now digitizing these things, some go back to the 1300s, mm -hmm. and you can, um, they're word searchable. I talked to hundreds of people, and then because I care so much about my craft, I decided to eat my way through the country. Mm, obviously, yeah. right. Yeah. It's a burden you have right, to carry, exactly. of course. Uh, right. and, and when I do, I, I call people who help me out, since I'm a soul food scholar, I, I call them research assistants. Oh, nice. So yeah. I'm always on the lookout for research assistants. Oh, wow. And so it was really, um, so the, the second book took four years, this one took about three. And it really because I had that solid foundation of that research uh, before mm. that I could draw upon. So I didn't have to start from scratch. I got you. You know, uh, and there are people who talk about, you know, for my for this process, you know, I drove across the country and aided places. And but there is a method to the madness. You're not just going into a city and like picking a random or, or are you like what what goes into that journey across the country I imagine that there's some kind of formula to it well I would love that I'm always jealous of these people that just drive around because I'm too broke to do that so you can't waste money yeah I had to I had to focus my trips mm -hmm. so I said okay well where am I likely to get the great barbecue stories and I didn't get to everywhere I wanted to just because of lack of resources and then the pandemic did cut that short so my my strategy was this um, I have a really good social media following mm -hmm. so I would just put it out there hey, I'm thinking about going to this place, where should I eat? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first cut. Uh, the second cut is I actually reached out to the food writers in certain cities and asked them for their spots. Mm -hmm. Now, sadly, they weren't up on a lot of the black joints, uh, no, believe it or not. So no that way. wasn't, the, I didn't get a lot, of, uh, but when I did get it, it was a gold mine. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is I actually did look at things like Yelp and TripAdvisor, not because I really believe what the people are writing there, but yeah. I just thought if a place was heavily, heavily commented upon, it's a place I pr probably should check out. Right. And then if I could, I always left a couple of days because it's just when you get into a place, you just find out about all those joints. And um, you know, it's just a matter of fact, a lot of African-American joints don't have a strong digital presence. So they don't, have a, they don't have a vibrant website. Mm -hmm. They're not on social media. So you just got to get to the community and, and find that. And, one th and you know, that's one thing I tell all the African-American uh, business owners who want, you know, if they want my advice, I'm just like, you, you got to get your social media game tight. Uh, that's a very good Because that's how people are finding you now. Yeah. Has, um, has that, has, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, even, even outside of barbecue, in my years of writing about restaurants out here, I saw how Instagram 
influenced the aesthetics of businesses. They would literally put in a space where people could go, take a photo, tag them, and it was huge for their business, you know, yeah. dedicated space for it. Um, has, <laughs> as not sound like, you know, us shouting at a cloud or something, but has social media hurt black businesses, helped black businesses? Like this influence, th this idea that you need to get the perfect shot of food because some of these places, you know, the food can be amazing. It might not be photogenic. Right. You know, so. Yeah. So I think it's a double edged sword. Mm -hmm. So one thing, the, the, the black businesses that have figured this piece out, they're, they're doing well and they're thriving. Right. I think the, the, the downside of it is what you just said. Um, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of black barbecue is messy. Um, and so it's not Instagrammable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing is because so many white joints are doing that, people are coming to barbecue. They're believing that's what legit barbecue is. Mm -hmm. And um, I, and so, you know, I've, I've posted pictures from black joints and people are like, there's too much sauce on there or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I know where that's coming from. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is it's having real uh, consequences for these black businesses mm -hmm. because with the ascendancy of, say, Central Texas barbecue, focused on brisket and that kind of, now people are walking into black joints across the country who are traditionally pork-based and they're that's asking, where's the brisket? Oh, wow. And if it's not on the menu, they're walking out because they've gotten the message, that's what great barbecue is. So now these black barbecuers are responding in two different ways. Some are just like, all right, you know, this, this is what I do. Others are like, oh man, I, I can't lose these, these customers. Let me start making brisket. And I, I gotta tell you, there's a lot of mediocre brisket being made. Oh, wow, that's interesting. I never thought about the influence of, wow, yeah, that's, yeah. that's super interesting. Right, so, that, so I, don't get an, I don't get an attitude when somebody brags about their favorite tradition. Uh -huh. I get an attitude when someone says, this is the only way to make legitimate barbecue. Yeah. Because then it excludes all of these other traditions. Yeah. And, you know, my, my tagline about a lot of this stuff is there's room to cook out for everyone. Mm -hmm. So don't stop saying this is the only way to do it. Let's start talking about, well, this is how I do it. But there's other ways that people do it. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. What is something um, if you uh, what do you want people to take away from this book? If you had to if you were stuck on an elevator and had to explain to them what you wanted them to walk away with yeah. after they read it. What is that? I, I would say that Black Smoke is a celebration of African-American barbecue culture. Uh, it's a restoration of African-Americans to the barbecue narrative because unfortunately a lot of barbecue media, African-Americans are pushed to the sidelines or left out entirely. And um, it's a pushback on the idea that um, barbecue media has fallen deeply, madly, softly, tenderly in love with white dudes who barbecue. Uh, and those are the those are, have been, are presented as the barbecue experts and really quickly though the archetypes that I point out in my book is you got the you know the Bubba type the working class rural kind of white guy you've got the competition guy mm -hmm. you've got mm -hmm. the urban hipster you mm -hmm. know interesting facial hair glasses mm -hmm. tattoos piercings uh, and then you have the toke who smokes so you've got the fine dining chefs who are now in barbecue in a way they have never were two decades ago. Right. Uh, and then the last thing I want is just, you know, if you get invited to a black barbecue, don't show up with raisins in your coleslaw or your potato salad. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, we were having such a good time. I forgot to give us the 10-minute the ten minute warning. Um, if you have, uh, we're going to be answering questions in a couple of minutes. Uh, sorry for the late notification. But if you have questions for Adrian, could you please now begin quietly lining up in the back and, uh, and we'll get to them. I gotta admit, this is the most fun I've had in a while. Oh, but good. This, is, this is a blast. This, um, and so, okay, uh, while we have that, uh, just the topical, have you had a chance to like eat around? Actually, let me ask you this. We, we've been able to put uh, descriptions on regions of barbecue. Have you thought about, is there like a Bay Area type of barbecue or just, or is it just kind of like the, I guess the homogenization of a bunch? Yeah, of it's things. an amalgamation. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, um, I just see, uh, I don't, I have not picked up a distinctive uh, Bay Area Stop. barbecue vibe. Yeah. yeah. I just haven't seen it. Um, and I think part of it is great migration story. You've got people that have shown up here from a lot of different places. Uh, and so I, I have not seen that. Um, but that doesn't mean that there, it could not develop. You right. Know. It could. I think one thing that might be interesting that could be distinctively Bay Area is vegan barbecue. I went to Vegan uh, Mob yeah. yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got Chef Bryant Terry here. Bryant uh, Terry, and yeah. And a lot of interesting things happening with vegan uh, in this area. So 
Uh, and this comes from a guy who I want to create a Denver barbecue style. Because uh, okay. 100 years ago, we were known for lamb and bison. In fact, if you go to a knowledgeable butcher and ask for a Denver rack, they're going to give you lamb ribs. Really? Yeah, but we just got away from it. So I'm trying to bring that back. And one, one thing you find out when you get into barbecue culture, as much as we talk about tradition, there's an artifice to it mm -hmm. that, you know, you could start something. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of you just got to get enough people on board mm -hmm. in order to say that that's a regional style. So... Um, really I, in the Q&A, if people think there is a Bay Area style, I would love to hear that, but I, I just don't see one. Yeah. I just see, ele I see, I see elements from other places yeah. that show up here. The vegan, I, the vegan part is very, very interesting. There's another place in Oakland that, uh, that I'll tell you about before, before we okay. part. Um, okay. So we're at zero minutes, and uh, so let's answer some audience questions. Um, Gentlemen, this has been a gas. Thank you. <laughs> Could you say just a few more words about what you drink with all this barbecue, besides the red stuff? <laughs> no, that's, that's it. Uh, no, so it really, it just depends on where you are. Um, but uh, in places like Texas, for instance, Juneteenth, uh, you're supposed to have a red drink. Because in Juneteenth, red foods symbolize the blood shed by ancestors. So barbecue is red by sauce. You have watermelon as dessert and then red drink, mainly Big Red from Waco, Texas, or some kind of strawberry soda. But um, through a lot of the Deep South, it's really sweet tea and lemonade that you'll find a lot. In fact, there was a writer named Fred Thompson who has argued that the sweetness of the tea varies based on the barbecue sauce. So if you're in the Carolinas with that more vinegary, you're gonna have sweeter tea, you know, where the spoon stands straight up. And then, <laughs> and then if you go other places, it's gonna be you know, less, less sweet. So um, a lot of black rum barbecue joints, and I think it's maybe a reflection of not having a liquor license or also, you know, a lot of black um, business owners are religious. And so maybe they just don't want to have alcohol in their place, but it's usually soft drinks. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be uh, tea, like some kind of sweet tea or iced tea, uh, red drink and lemonade. That's what I see the most. Yes. So I just wanted to see if you could touch on a little the differences between, say, Carolina barbecue or Texas barbecue, Kansas City barbecue, and what about those places develop that style of barbecue? Yeah, okay, so I'll try to do this really quickly. So uh, the Carolinas, Virginia and Carolinas, I, I argue is the birthplace of barbecue as we understand it, whole hog. So in the eastern parts of that state, it's gonna be whole hog and pretty much uh, vinegar with red pepper. So that was the earliest barbecue sauce. And, and we, it's really unfair to call it a sauce because it was added throughout the barbecuing process. So it's really a flavor enhancer. And a lot of people have an attitude about um, North Carolina barbecue because of the vinegar. And I, I would say that you probably have had bad North Carolina barbecue because if you have somebody, a barbecue made by somebody who knows what they're doing, um, there's a depth of flavor that's pretty amazing. So then as you move to the western part of the state, North Carolina, you get more ketchup added to the sauce. And then it's more about pork shoulders rather than whole hog cooking. And that... Um, introduction of some ketchup and tomato in those sauces shows the gradual adoption of tomatoes because for a long time people wouldn't eat tomatoes because they thought it was poisonous because it's part of the nightshade family and so then you go to South Carolina you have more you have pork shoulder and whole hog and then you've got a bunch of different sauces you've got the vinegar you've got some mustard you've got some tomato then there's deep south uh, pork shoulder ribs chicken with a kind of sweet thin tomato based sauce and southern soul food sides. Uh, then we get to Kentucky where you have a lamb-based barbecue mutton um, with the Worcestershire sauce. It's pretty unique, it's very hyper-local. You've got Memphis, which is a really eclectic place showing the, you know, so uh, wet or dry ribs. And dry ribs are really a seasoning. It's not really a method. It's just this one guy, Charlie Rogos, at the rendezvous decided to add Greek seasoning to slabs of ribs. And all of a sudden that's a dry, but that, that, that's just that one place. I don't know anybody else who does that. <laughs> Uh, and then a shoulder sandwich with coleslaw stuff. But then Memphis has got some cool stuff because they got barbecue spaghetti. If, if you've never heard of barbecue yeah, spaghetti, a, uh -huh. noodles, barbecue sauce instead of marinara, and grilled meat. Oh, you're shaking your head, but you, have a, you need to experience this. It's on point. It's yeah. good. It's good. And barbecue bologna. Uh, yeah, it was just awesome, too. Um, and then, you know, you, in Texas, you have three different styles. So when people say Texas barbecue, they're really talking about central Texas usually which is a reflection of Central European immigrants landing in that spot, bringing their meat smoking traditions. And so a lot of these early barbecue joints were actually just butcher shops, and they started smoking the stuff they couldn't sell. 
and then that they started selling it to ranch hands and agricultural workers around. So that's the earliest Central Texas barbecue stand. But in the south of Texas, you've got the Latino barbacoa tradition, more earth ovens. And then in East Texas, you've got heavily African-American influenced barbecue uh, because uh, slaveholders brought enslaved African, African-Americans to that part in the 1820s and 30s. And we have on record African-Americans doing Southern barbecue. Another region that doesn't get much love is south side of Chicago. Rib tips, chicken, uh, hot link sausages with fries. Um, you got St. Louis, St. Louis, they've got not only the ribs, but also something called snoots, which are pig snouts, not for everybody. Uh, and then turkey ribs, that's another thing that's come out of St. Louis. And turkey ribs are taking the shoulder blade, cutting enough meat around it so it looks kind of like a rib. Um, and so that, that comes out of St. Louis. And then Kansas City, uh, agricultural town, so you've got a real mix of pork, beef, mutton, all kinds of stuff uh, showing up there. Uh, so to, to me, those are the major traditions. O- outside of that, you've got hyper-local stuff, like in Santa Maria, California, you've got the tri-tip tradition cooked over red oak. Um, so there, there are things that pop up, but those are, the I would say, the main styles. Yeah. Earlier you brought up that barbecues reached historically sizes of thousands of people, but also in you, your book you mentioned that it was part of small family gatherings. It doesn't seem to be something that you eat by yourself, so what does that say about community and the heart of barbecuing? Oh yeah, so barbecue commands community. So the early, you know, when you're cooking a whole animal, you, you have to have a lot of people get together to eat it, especially at a time when there's no refrigeration. And so that's why I think uh, barbecue emerged as the perfect party food. Uh, And the people that figured out barbecue draws a crowd early on were um, politicians and preachers. Uh, Because that's where you see a lot of these gatherings. They figure out, oh, I can, if I make this barbecue, I can get a lot of people here. Maybe they'll do something I want them to do, like vote for me or join my church. Uh, And so we see that. But there's also this other part of barbecue that emerges as, you know, building family, uh, which is a different type of community. Uh, And uh, here's the interesting thing. The, the regional traditions that we fight about so much that I went through, focusing on smaller cuts of meat, those are really only about a century year or old, only about a century old. Um, it's, it, for two centuries, it was whole hog cooking. And then as we shift from a rural context to an urban context, cooking a whole animal doesn't make sense all the time in an urban context. So that's when we start to focus on ribs, pork shoulder, brisket. And then there was a huge wave of innovation that leads to a lot of these styles. So I think the family aspect of barbecue emerges with that kind of smaller cooking. And then when the 1950s, when people have backyards and they can do this, and there's, there's a vibrant public park tradition of cooking barbecue. I think that all comes together. Yeah. Great. Um, if nobody else here has a question, we are going to answer some from our live stream on YouTube. Um, so we have two. One, can you please comment at all on Asian-style barbecue, specifically Korean barbecue? It's now gained a lot of steam in the United States. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so um, the Asian styles, I, I hope people don't get mad. I would call more like grilling um, than I would describe barbecue. And that's one thing that I've been getting pushback about because, you know, some people are saying, well, you know, barbecue is the same all over the world Yeah. because it's cooking, it's meat, flame, and wood. And I said, well, yeah, but then how come all these people are showing up in the U.S. trying to learn how to do this? Um, so to me, the Asians follow like yakitori and other things. I think of those as just kind of grilling traditions. But one thing that is undeniable is that with the popularity of barbecue over the last couple of decades, there is now a, uh, a real desire to explore go- global grilling traditions. And I think that's, um, you know, the Asian barbecue that we have is just awesome. And I think that that's, um, you know, feeding that desire. And um, I, I think as we start, I think we're going to have more exploration of grilling traditions around the world. So I think it's an exciting time for barbecue. But I just want to maintain, I think that Southern barbecue has an exceptional quality. Um, and this is going to be our last audience question. How can we bring more black chefs and their historical food knowledge to the publishing world's attention? Good question. So uh, Rodney Scott, who's a person, if you're into barbecue uh, or if not, you're just somebody you need to know. Rodney Scott is a barbecuer from Hemingway, South Carolina and he's doing whole hog barbecue, and he's got a spot in Allen Charleston, Birmingham. He's just opening one up in Atlanta. He came out with a book called Rodney Scott's World of Barbecue. It is the first book published by a black barbecuer in three decades. Now think about all the books that come out, right? So one thing that I think is gonna spark this is first of all, gobble up all the books by African Americans because these publishers are looking at sales. And if they see Rodney Scott's book doing well, they see my book doing well, they will 
you know, commission other books. Um, the other thing is just uh, social media, start following African Americans in the barbecue circles because now, sadly, um, there are publishers that are looking at social media engagement before they give book deals. Oh, wow. So, you know, what you all can help is start amplifying people you like, and that will get them in that space. All right. Um, so we have one last question. Um, Thank you to our audience for all of your great questions, by the way. Uh, but to Adrian, here's the last thing. What, and this is a tradition here, by the way. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Wow, all right, pressure's on. Yeah, something simple just to close this out. Yeah, so I actually have been thinking about this. So I've been thinking about a concept, and I'm not the only one who's been thinking about this, but mm -hmm. I'll claim it. Um, a concept called the welcome table. And so I was thinking about a limited di dinner series uh, guide to difficult conversations. Mm. So the first, the first would be a potluck, y'all come, gather in this space, this is why we're here. You know, some people aren't gonna join. The next one, for lack of a better term, the marginalized group that's affected by the challenge, it's their platform. Mm. Uh, the second, the third meeting would be a clapback. So all the people who are not part of that marginalized group would say, here's what we heard, this is how we're processing it. And then the last would be uh, a meal where we talk about the journey together. So the food story oh, wow. is this, potluck first, mm -hmm. second meeting, everybody else who's outside of the marginalized groups cooks the food of the marginalized group. Mm -hmm. Third meeting is comfort food, because we're you know, processing stuff. And then the last meeting would be a fusion of all the people who have been part of that journey. So I love that. that's what I'm thinking of. So I call it the welcome yeah. table. That's really good. Don't steal that. Do not steal that. Everyone, now it's a race to see who can make it first. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Just right. threw it out there. Um, all right. So I think we're going to close it out. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for joining me today at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I would like to remind our audience that Adrian's book, Black, <coughs> excuse me, Black Smoke, African Americans in the United States of Barbecue, can be purchased here on site or through your preferred bookseller. Uh, if you'd like to watch some more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming this year, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Justin Phillips, and thank you for being here.